Killing is not a good thing at any time. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> Doesn't take long to break the guy's neck. You're trying to get information out of somebody. People forget that at that point, you have to get the information. You'll get it. Those Germans killed those guys, so we got to do a little killing of our own. So it was probably an incentive. But when you got to kill because they're going to kill you right now, if you don't protect yourself, you know. Hell, I joined the outfit for that. Their enemies called them murdering bastards and throat slitters. They haunted the nightmares of German troops in Italy and southern France. They took on missions that no other Allied force could handle, nor would want to. They did routinely what others said could not be done. They killed 25 of their enemy for every man they lost. They captured 235 enemy soldiers for every man of theirs taken prisoner. They were one of the most feared and deadly Allied combat units during the Second World War. They are the first special service force, or as they like to be called, the Black Devils. The story begins and ends here in Helena, Montana. This is Fort William Henry Harrison. We stand right where we are now. It's like, almost like it was when we got here. The Black Devils have come back to Helena to mark 60 years of history. We did our bayonet training over in this area, beyond the cemetery. We did our flamethrowers uh, in that same general area. And the rifle range is that we used is here, still here. It was here where a special bond was forged so many years ago, and the place where their remarkable journey began. The Arctic, cold, hard, unyielding, eminently hostile to life and growth, impervious to cultivation. You shouldn't believe everything you hear. Hey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
if a person really likes standing in bank lineups, and if a person really likes long traffic jams, and if a person really likes to commute for two hours every day, don't come to Yellowknife. Some people have said that Yellowknife lives a lot bigger than it is. So you have all of the same amenities that you have in a capital city, but you also have all the benefits of a smaller town. You just have to embrace it and get out and do stuff. You can walk out the back door, strap on a pair of skis, and off you go. And, uh, and that's, that's, for me, that's really a great part of living in the north. You can go uh, kite skiing. That's uh, something that a lot of people are now doing in Yellowknife, and I took it up myself last year, and it's something that I'm really enjoying. I thought uh, before I moved here that I had seen Northern Lights uh, because I had seen the occasional one. After I moved here, I realized what Northern Lights really were. together perfectly. This bumbling fool is the key. <laughs> that woman is positively bursting with antibiotics. The time is ripe for us. They've created a perfect breeding ground for super bugs. Basically, after 1783, the British just ignore the treaties. Right? They just ignore them, right? like they've never been written. So, uh, but the, for the Mi'kmaq, uh, particularly, but, he, but more so also for the Maliseet and the Passamaquoddy, they kept on saying, but we have these treaties. Right? We signed a treaty. Our fathers, our grandfathers, our forefathers signed a treaty with the British. Right? And we signed that treaty, and we agreed we were going to share this land. Well, get, what happened, right? We don't have any land anymore. It's been taken all away from us. We can't hunt, we can't fish. Our children are dying because they don't have enough to eat. Native people here, the indigenous people, were uh, dispossessed of everything, including their wealth, their land, their, their prosperity, and in a good many cases, their lives. Um, so there's a very deliberate, savage and barbaric nature to British colonialism in the period after 1783. Let's get rid of these people because they are savage. That, and this is how the British describe the Mi'kmaq. They are a savage, barbaric people. But you have to turn it on its head and think, well, who's being savage and barbaric here? Right? But certainly, there is a deliberate policy of the trying to exterminate these people. Right? That's what's going on. Now, that begins to reverse by the 1860s, and really with Confederation in, in Canada, by the 1860s and 1870, that policy has turned. right? Um, and there's a, a more deliberate attempt to um, ameliorate the situation of the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, and the Passamaquoddy and create reserves on which they can live, right? Where in which they can live and perhaps they can survive. 